Hallelujah. Father, great joy, great joy, great joy, great joy, great joy, great, great joy, great joy, great joy. Hallelujah. Great joy. Joy, 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 joy. I remember when I got saved. You'd go to churches and it seemed like sometimes that's all I'd hear is people say joy, 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 joy. And then they'd say this, more, <laughs> more, until the whole place was laughing hysterically. And when I say whole place, there's always going to be someone. I'm not going to laugh no matter what you tell me. Minister would crack a joke. People would accuse the ministers of laughing gas. I don't know why the Spirit drew me to this. To Proverbs 10, 22. The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, and he adds no sorrow to it. So normally I read that verse and I'm, I'm looking at the blessing in Christ, Galatians 3, 13, of the Lord. That's where we get the blessing. It's not just, oh, be blessed. It is a legitimate, the Holy Ghost came to put this upon you, and the Holy Spirit is the blessing. And in the Holy Spirit, you're made rich in all things. He maketh rich. He, the blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, period. And he adds no sorrow to it because it's joy. Why? Because everywhere the Holy Ghost go goes, there's joy. That was just along my way to um, 1722. A merry heart, as a lot of you know, does good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. A merry heart does good like a medicine. So we carry on. Oh, interesting. It's not where we're going today, but it's where we're at right now. I don't know about you, but I got to scroll. All right, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it the. Do, 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 do. Nehemiah. I went the wrong direction. The joy of the Lord, Nehemiah 8.10. The joy of the Lord is your strength. But right before that, it says, neither be you sorry. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Not where I was going, but on this on this uh, January 6th day, there is tension raging out there in the political climate of the United States. It's January 6th. It's 2021. Everybody's wondering um, what's going on in the presidency. You have many people that believe this thing was stolen. You have many people that believe they just want to move past Trump. And you have many people who just don't care. Remember, 85 million voted supposedly for one guy and like 70-something million or 80 million for another guy. But there's still 100 million people that said, I don't care. I'm not voting. So where am I at today? Um, I'm in a season of prayer. And... Um, and I'm going to say that uh, when I lean into that, that Holy, Holy Jesus, Spirit of God, joy and peace and the word of faith in my on my tongue goes away for me almost immediately. Maybe you relate to me. You voted. Um, you're ready for it to be over. You're ready for whatever's going to happen to happen so we can move through it because God is the blessing and he has blessed you in Christ Jesus and that you're ready, like I am, to go through anything, but you also know you don't want to go through anything. I mean, come on, man. You wake up. I know we'll be persecuted, but I want to be persecuted not for because I voted for Trump. 
or you voted for Biden. I want to be persecuted because I get the sick healed, the lame walk, the blind see, I minister Jesus Christ. Because Romans 1, I heard a minister say this last night, I read Romans 1 with him, and, uh, and I agreed. You know, you can go out and read Romans 1 in public and probably get eggs thrown at you, no doubt about it. I could, read, I could post Romans 1 scriptures for a week and probably lose a tenth of my friends list. Well, probably not because you can unfollow people, but it'd make more unfollowers. The world is never going to follow Jesus. They hate Jesus. They hate you. Okay, who cares? Get over it. Let's roll on. No matter what happens, no matter what goes on, well, it's not constitutional. Look, let's look at, is it biblical? Is it, is it biblical? Well, God says, listen, every time someone says, well, God says, nine times out of ten, I hear a self-will proclamation of what I'm supposed to be doing that they're probably not doing. You know, every single person that I watched on social media, every one of you, that I watched on social media, including myself, when I got to my, well, Trump this or or, or stand for the government, stand against the government and stand against tyranny. And the guy that wrote the stand against tyranny and he's got his own memorial in D.C. and it, 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 he owns 600 slaves. <laughs> I'm not laughing at slavery. I'm laughing at the, the, the absolute hypocrisy. What, what are you going to tell me? Well, brother, uh, he didn't have a conviction to not own slaves. Are you out of your mind? The Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit who came to destroy the works of the devil, who came to stand against all op opposition and oppression of people, didn't convict a generation of leaders, and people are making excuses for that. Man, they've got excuses longer than my... Well, I can't even think of anything. I just can't. I was going to say something like longer than my rap sheet, but I don't really got a very long rap sheet, so that wouldn't make sense. But I mean, let's move on. And what do I mean by that? Press on. Press on. There's a church that I went to in West Virginia, and they're, they're in a season of fasting and prayer, and they're teaching consistently on pressing on. I follow the senior pastor I got to meet him and uh, was impressed I'm not usually impressed with people as a spirit-led child of God I was impressed and uh, most of you that know me know I don't say that lightly and uh, and I judge diligently through the scripture but mostly from the in, inner witness of my inner man but man that that guy's uh, that guy's on point brethren I count not myself to have apprehended but one thing, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before me, before me, ahead of me, in front of me, part of my future. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus let us, therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. If anything be in you otherwise, God will reveal it to you. Why would God reveal it to you? So you can get over it. <laughs> get out of it. Press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I'm going to humor myself. You know, I, I've started studying in front of you sometimes many, many, many moons ago. And I see other people doing it. I know I didn't start it. I know the Holy Ghost did. But I also love seeing other people do it because it's like it's humility to admit to people. Let me look this up real quick somewhere else and see what it says. When I see things link up that I do that other ministers do, it tells me I'm I'm in the right I'm in the right community. You understand? Uh, do, 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 do. Oh yeah, that's right. 
This one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. What I was looking up to see is finished date. He says it's the heavenly calling, God calling me on high. I've always been convicted that it's an in, in individual calling that you might be called and what you're called to, what your ministry is, what your focus is. Ultimately, it's the high calling, though, because he is right. It does say, it does say clearly in there. I count not myself to have apprehended but one thing. Now, see, in the King James, they torch this verse because they put these squiggly words in there. And unlike many books that have squiggly writing, as a friend of mine and a mentor of mine says, squiggly writing in a lot of books means it's important. Squiggly writing in the Bible is added stuff that I personally believe once you start reading the Bible and taking, people make fun of me because I, I like to go to the Greek and the Hebrew and just see what that original word means. But I listened to Tiff Shuttlesworth talk about fasting yesterday, and he talked about the original word for fasting in the Hebrew means to just cover your mouth, to shut your mouth. And I thought, <laughs> we teach fasting is so many other things, and you hear fasting, well, brother, you can go out and eat all this food and, and still be fasting. And it's like, no, the original intent of fasting was to shut your mouth. Imagine the original intent of the Daniel's fast. When Daniel started fasting, he didn't have a time frame. Three weeks was the declaration because that's when the end result happened, but that wasn't the declaration from the beginning, the way I read that and the way I hear other ministers teach it. And so I know I'm not alone. I'm in good, good company. But this shut our mouth. When I look at Hebrew and Greek words and I look at Blue Letter Bible, who I recommend strongly, and donate five bucks to them, they're, they're a... There are great people that put out free resources. And I love free Christian resources because Christ is free. Well, it'll cost you everything. Listen, crack cost me everything. Bud Light cost me everything. Sexual sin, immorality cost me everything. Jesus Christ, I came to him broke, busted, disgusted, strung out, drunk myself to pieces, wasn't even 21 years old and said, help, help. And he said, here you go. How's that like a, Like I'm giving him a gift? When people say, well, you had to give it your all. You think me giving him me is a gift to him? Now, for him, I understand today it was. He wanted that. He died for that. He shed his blood to purge sins off me, to make me holy, to give me a great life, but for me to be his. But at the time, at the time, that's a pointless, worthless gift. I'll tell it to you flat like I saw it. Flat like I still see it today. Pointless gift. Who wants, who, listen, you, I want you to open up your door for the next total strung out crack junkie, alcoholic, totally bend out on banging whatever he wants. Yeah, I said it. Doing whatever he wants sexually, whatever he wants. Doing it, walking all over people in his life. No friends left because people had to kick me out of their weddings, kick me out of their life. Because what? Because I was nothing but a wrecking ball that would roll through your life, taking whatever I wanted. I might go home and whine, oh man, it feels like people are so, and then blame everybody else for my problems. Run around, run my mouth like I'm some kind of tough guy knowing I hate that life. I hated being that guy. And I got called a tough guy about him two months ago and I just sat there. Cause I was like, I hate being called a tough guy. I am not tough. I'm not no fighter, no bad boy. I am a Holy Ghost filled Christian. When that first mentor and I got saved and he looked at me and he said, you can be whoever you want to be and God will help you. And I just went, what? Wait a minute. I like country music, but I never really told people I like country music. I don't, I could, I had to pretend everywhere I was. I love, and I did. I liked metal. I said like, not like. I'm not going to deny to you that I'm, I'm not a. I'm not going to go down the secular music road. You do you, I'll do me. But, man, I like all kinds of music. And I, I'd be metal if I was around metal and rap if I was around rap and parachute pants if I was around parachute. I never just stuck a pair of jeans, a pair of boots on and a shirt and said, I'm me. I'm me. A friend of mine reminded me of that. I started to get entrapped into that mindset. He reminded me the other day. 
Uh, basically, I'm following the Holy Ghost and the changes that I'm doing in my life. I am following the Spirit of God, making sure that He wills it to be. And, and I seek other people, mostly my wife, and what I'm doing and asking her those things. Because I, it's just it's a long story, but how you look, how you will, and how you care for your temple, um, sometimes we can get trapped into, well, i got to weigh so much, look so much, but follow the Holy Ghost. All right, let's dive into number 13. This one, this one's exciting. We're going to get another blind man. If you lay it out, um, we're going to get another blind man. We're in, we're in, uh, where are we at, man? AD, let me see if I can catch this. Not that it's that important, but. So Jesus in John 8 is going to give the discourse on being the light of the world. He's going to tell people, I'm, I am, in John 8, 12, Jesus spake again unto them saying, I am the light of the world. Say it. Say, I am the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world. He that followeth after me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Say, I have the light of life. Amen. So he gives that discourse. Now watch this. Not long after, and there's no time frames in chronological. You just know that this stuff happens pretty quick. Could be 30 days, could be three minutes. I have no idea, but it happens relatively quickly. Jesus comes up, and as Jesus passed by, John 9, verses 1, this is kind of a long one, verses 1 through 41, John 9. This story's only told in John 9, and this is leading up to the Good Shepherd coming from the Discourse on Light. He's told the parable of the Good Samaritan. If you get a chronological Bible and look at it, it's kind of, it, it, to me, it's mind, it's mind and just gets me entrenched in this Gospels and the storyline. Um, it also just just lays out a, lays out the um, where I'm at in history, where I'm at with Christ. And I feel like it puts me in him. I, I don't know other way to say it. I feel like it puts me in him a little bit better and lets me see, oh, you just taught on being the light of the world. And now here shortly after, watch this, John 9, 1. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me, while it's day. The night comes when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. He is the light of the world, and his light is your life. Woo! Go back to John 8. You can flip a couple pages. Then spake Jesus again, I am the light of the world. He that follows after me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. I understand we don't want elections stolen. I understand we don't want theft. It's against the commandments. I'm just not naive enough to believe that this is the first time it's ever happened. It might be a time in history I don't want it to happen. But I stand on what I said yesterday. I'm going to pursue the light because Jesus is the light. I don't have it here, but I bought this, uh, I bought this uh, bracelet the other day from the bookstore, Paxson Bookstore, Jacksonville, Florida. You can order online. That's a shot, shot plug for them because excellent, excellent store. I bought this bracelet, Jesus is the Light, because I just want to be reminded. I heard a sermon from Nathan Morris at Evangel Temple about a month ago. Uh, actually, November 29th, if you look it up. I remember because I just watched it again. In the morning session, he preaches on Jesus is the Light. Best sermon on Jesus is the Light I've ever heard. Probably owns only sermon in 23 years I've ever heard. A lot of things are being preached right now by preachers and ministers and taught. Evangelists are shouting high from the rooftops right now, and they should. Um, they haven't been quiet. Like, I don't want to act like they've been quiet. Many of the evangelists, they just haven't been as, as you, I haven't seen them as much because what happened? Who steps to the forefront when the church gets quiet and starts to decrease? God's going to bring his voice to the forefront because he's never going to let his church. It's his church. It's his church. It's not my church. It's not the pastor's church. The building is, is the building. Well, the building, the building is important because it houses the body, which is the church. So therefore, by proxy, it becomes part of the church. That's a fresh conviction for me because I've spoken very much about the fact that 
It's a building. You can have church and houses like they did. Well, the house was a building too. So I just had a conviction of don't come against the church being a, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So the church is Jesus Christ's church and he's going to protect it. He's going to prosper it. He's going to add to the number to it daily. And if it's starting to shrink back from what his will is, he's going to bring that voice up. Now the apostolic call has been preaching it, that this is coming, and now the evangelists are coming in and calling those in. And when the members of that church start to fade, which he says can happen, even those of faith will start to fade. When that starts to happen, he's not going to stop calling in fresh bodies, fresh fire, fresh Holy Spirit baptisms. He's going to keep on coming. He's going to keep coming till he comes back. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Verse 6. When he had thus spoken, he spat. He loves to spit on these blind people, man. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle. And, the anoint, and then he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. How many of you know that if Jesus takes dirt from the ground and breathes on it, the breath of life and molds it in, he can make a man? Or if he grabs it and spits on it, he can make clay to anoint you with? I don't want to get lost in the method, although I think there's a message in the fact that he spits on two blind people and uses spit. There's a message there. It's just not today's. When I, and I'm not full, I don't have full revelation of it. Don't want to imply that I do. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. Verse 7, and said unto him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way. That's where I got the, uh, the, the inclination to start a message on that. He spits, grabs dirt, makes clay, anoints a man, sends him to a place called sent. Clay is the molding, which is, represents a man being molded, spit, and then he anoints, and then sends. Man formed clay, anoints, sends. You can tear into that all you want. Have some fun with it. The neighbors, therefore, verse 8, the neighbors, therefore, 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 and they which before, and they which before, and they which before had seen him that was blind said, is not this the guy that sat and begged? Some said that he is he. Others said he's like him. Then the man said, I'm he. That's me. Therefore said they unto the blind man, the man that was blind, how were thine eyes opened? How were thine eyes opened? Remember, he said unto him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. I think when I sidebarred, I left the last half, the most important part of the verse off. The neighbors, therefore, and they which before had seen him that was blind, said, Is this not he that begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. But he said, I am he. Therefore said they unto him, How were thine eyes opened? He answered and said, A man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed mine eyes and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed, and I received sight. And I received sight. Then said they unto him, where is he? I'm going to stop there. The five things. The five things. I'm just going to tell you, my video is frozen right now. For some reason, when I use this format on iMovie from my FaceTime camera, it has frozen twice. I'm 24 minutes in, it looks like. I'm not stopping because of a frozen camera. I preached a message the other day, and after I got done preaching, I looked. I saw that I'd seen the frozen camera. I didn't know if it would show frozen. It does. I'm going to stop using this format after today. Good news is you're going to have to just listen because I'm not going to stop because I believe the Holy Ghost is in this message. He was in the other one the other day, but I redid it. And uh, and I believe he was in the one I redid as well. I might even post both just to just to share it with everybody. So right now we have the five things that we're, that we're narrowing in on that I'm showing as a pattern that happen every time someone's healed. Number one, we, the five things. Jesus is there. Number two, someone's sick. Number three, someone wants to be made whole. 
Number four, the word of faith is spoken. Number five, the word of faith is believed. To believe is to be acted upon and to be received. So number one, we see Jesus is there. Number two, the man born blind from birth. Number three, Jesus is there and wants this man well. And I believe the blind man wants to be well. He's been begging from birth. How do I know that? Because after he spits on his eye, he acts immediately. So number four, the word of faith is spoken. It says Jesus spat on the ground, formed it up. He spat on the ground, made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with clay. And he said unto him, go wash in the pool of Siloam. That's the word of faith spoken. What happened? He went his way, washed, and came seeing. He went his way, washed, and came seeing. He went his way, washed, and came seeing. He went his way, he washed, he came seeing. He went his way, he washed, he came seeing. Hallelujah. Whatever it is the Holy Spirit's telling you to do and is unctioning you to do in order to receive your healing, because it, whether it's you're believing, but you know sometimes in these moments Jesus will say, Go wash. Go to the pool of Siloam. Go do something. Maybe you need to lay hands on the neighbor. I'm not sure. But if you aren't receiving your healing, there may be a faith action that you've got to do. We talked about this before. Faith comes with, comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But faith is dead without the works. The works that are what? Cooperating with that faith. So if you are, all right, I believe and receive, I'm healed. I believe I receive, I'm healed. But God's telling you, stop eating the donuts and you shove down the donuts, but you keep saying, I believe I received, I'm healed. And listen, God is going to heal you, but you are in the way. Get out of the way. Get out of the way. It's that simple. This man didn't have to go wash. The other man didn't have to wash. This man didn't have to go wash, but he also could have stayed blind. He went to wash and asked for help. You know, James 5 says we go to the elders and we ask for help. We tell them and they anoint us. But what's this man have to do? This blind guy from birth didn't walk down to this pool of Siloam and bathe by himself, people. If he did, then he had two miracles. The Holy Ghost and angels took him. Now I'm frozen drinking coffee. Hallelujah. So he goes down the pool, washes, and he gets up, comes seeing. Hallelujah. He gets up, he comes seeing. The glory, the glory of God. Glory of God. The glory of God. So... I want to point out a couple other things out of this story because this is also the story. Number two, something about these blind healings that keep being used by people in the body of Christ to demonstrate things that aren't real. This one is going to be where they use the healing because this is what happens in the rest of this chapter. People come against and start questioning the healing, question the man, should Jesus heal? And we have, again, opposition, oppression against the healing power of Christ Jesus Christ being the Christ and being magnified is what the opposition's aiming to destroy. But if you look at this beginning verses in number two, the disciples asked him, Master, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Just because there's a tradition of sin being the cause, Jesus tells you something magnificent here. Now, I believe that we can prove without a shadow of a doubt and I'm going to roll through it here, that sin usually is the cause of sickness. And I'll show that to you. Acts 10.38, we're going to take a minute and go into this. I didn't mark mark these verses out, so bear with me as I look for them. Of course, you're watching me drink coffee for the last half a minute or 10 minutes. Acts 10.38, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. He, all, he healed all that were oppressed of the devil. Who do you have to heal? Those oppressed of the devil. They got healing that needed healing from sickness. They got they call it healing. They needed healing from demons being cast out. Hey, look, I'm back. Hello. So it that's one. Go to John 10:10. 10, 10. John 10:10. 10, 10. I'll go through them quick, but you can pause it or it'll pause itself. John 10:10. 10, 10. The thief comes not but to steal and kill and destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. What does the thief come to do? The devil comes to steal, to kill, to destroy. That's all that sickness does. It steals health. It steals life. 
It destroys life. That's what sickness does. People, that's it. So, and that's the devil that comes to do that. Um, we're going to go, I'm going to go to one. I, Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. And you hath he quickened who were dead in his trespasses and sins. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of this air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past. I'm going to sidebar. No, I'm not. Be quiet, Griff. Among whom also we had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Now, it does say God rich in his mercy, but the point to me bringing this up is sickness and sin is the cause of all the bad things in our lives. Whether it's the sin originally and now our nature of sin, or whether it's just flat point that we're sinning, sin is the cause. That's why I, I'm, I'm hindering as much as I feel the Holy Spirit is letting me and as gently as I can, but yet determined to hinder all of these sinful acts that I see in America that have become, I've accepted because I've turned on their TV shows, I've let their language, I've let their sexual morality, I've befriended them, then I've befriended them and, and I'm, they're not getting saved. I've befriended them, and I talked about this yesterday, being friends with someone for 20 years, but they don't get saved, but they continue to be homosexual. I understand I might not be called to, to change everybody's life, but if I'm not bearing witness and you're comfortable around me, I'm sorry, but that's a fault for me. I'm not to condemn you. I'm to raise up Jesus and praise him. I'm to let him be the light, but I am to be the in him the light, and that light shine like a city on a hill, preaching refuge and preaching that it's sin and preaching that, hey, when these people, that's why... That's why a lot of these folks, they have looked in this time and this season and they have found reasons now that I've said, look, I've stayed quiet trying to do the love your neighbor approach and it's not work. And I said, I felt the Holy Spirit conviction. If these people die and go to hell, you're guilty because they're never, they're going to hurt your, I love you. I'm, I'm your friend and we can laugh and joke on Facebook. But have you ever told them, I love you? But what you're living is going to take you to hell. And the answer is, yes, I have. Every one of them. Yes, I have. And they know it. And they know it when they see me. And they know it when they know me. I don't. I just don't walk up to them every time I see them. I will still hug them. I will still love them. I will still be nice to them. But they have to know. This is, hey, look, well, I'm a family member to many of them. That he, he believes Oh, he's one of them old religious guys. He believes that I'm going to go to hell for my sexual behavior. Yes, I do. Your sexual behavior is your God, and in and that's it. And that, that's exactly what it says in Romans 1. You will burn for that behavior, and for eternity and torturous term, inter, inter, in, in eternity. And I don't want that for you. I've never been one of those guys, ever. I want to help the lost. I want to disciple people. I've never been one that's like, we got to get these people saved. We've got to get, I've always wanted them to get born again. But I've always seen people get them saved and then leave them hanging and not teach them and they go back and they go back and they go back. And I, I really want to quote this John G. Lake thing, but I don't have the quote lo, lo, notation. But it's been said that John G. Lake, and, and you can look this up for yourself, but it's been said that John G. Lake was a big fan of those, of those, of the uh, healing tents. Um, and the revivals and things they did, but he was a big fan. He had all these little, I don't know what they called them, I forget, houses of healing or whatever they were called, where people went, and he said they'd come one week and they'd get a little better, and the next week get a little better. And he almost preferred those versus the miracles of healing. Actually, I think he said he did prefer them is what I remember, because people kept coming back and getting fed the word of faith. And, kept, and by getting the word of faith, they would have this great faith, and they would handle any healing situation in their life. And then the miracle, people who got the miracles tended to not go to the Word of God as much. So it's like, I want to get people saved, hear my heart, but I always want to teach them. That's my heart, is I want to teach them the Word of faith so they can stay there. They don't have to call Griff and say, hey, you know, our pastor, I got, 
I, I hear it in my church all the time. I hear my pastor say it from the pulpit, many, many pastors say it from the pulpit. But they talk about the church, that they're and they're available to them. They're pastors' hearts. They want to be. A lot of pastors aren't available for their people, that, but they're not real pastors. But that's another story. A pastor that's available to his sheep, and the shepherd that's shepherding his sheep is going to be available to him no matter what. But he shouldn't have to get calls every time. A post on Facebook every time. Oh, my God, I need prayer again. You need prayer because you don't have any faith. And you think prayer is going to give you faith. And prayer does not give you faith. Getting in the Word of God gives you faith. I saw somebody post up yesterday, an uh, Instagram spot, where the man said, Our awareness of the goodness of God is our, it, 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 you're, you're never going to have more faith than you have an awareness of the goodness of God. That sounds so cute, but it's such bull crap. It's such new age. My awareness of God's goodness is going to grow from my faith. So I hear what he's saying in reverse, but preach it the way the Word of God is. All these, this world and all this snappy talk, I've done it. For years I did it. That's why I hate it. That's Come on now, you know me, I'm going to tell you the truth. I hate it because I did it for years. I don't want this snappy little one-liner get all my likes and all my stuff. And maybe I'll reach somebody. You're not reaching anybody because you, you, it might be the right and the truth, but it's twisted upside down. And a lot of people are going to have to do what I did and sit there and go, what's he talking about? And more people are going to look at it and go, all right, unfollow this fool. In reality, he's a great man of God, but they're, all of them are caught. Now, they're California boys, so maybe out in Cali, you know, that's the way they, they, they reach people best. I don't know. I don't buy it. I just want to see the gospel preached. And I'm not condemning him. I, I said honestly to you, you, if you listen to me, that I don't like it. I hate it for me. Now, they may be reaching millions. And actually, that man is reaching millions. So God bless him and what he's doing if the Holy Ghost led him to write that. Me, I read that and I go, no, it's time for me to cut all that out of my life and just put the pureness up. I don't want any distortion. Yes, the goodness of God is a wonderful thing. Yes, the goodness of God is, is wonderful. It's not part of my foundation and faith. And that's where I teach from. I teach from the basics. I teach, my mentor tells me, you don't leave the man discipling me. And you don't leave the fundamentals. You don't have to go back to them. Well, I got to get back to the basics, man. I fell off the deal again. No, don't leave the basics. Don't leave the fundamentals. You don't have to go back to them. You know, and Kenneth Copeland teaches all the time. You know what a golfer is that's in the pros? Someone who's mastered the fundamentals. That's why I don't like all that. Now, look, that's why I didn't say the minister's name. I love him and I follow him. I didn't unfollow him. I love him and I follow him. I just, I have a personal conviction against those. My wife will tell you, I hate those one-liners. She'll post them and I'll be like, eh, I'll comment underneath there. And then I, I listen to the Holy Spirit say, that's your wife. She can post what she wants. Shut up. But that's another story. This number 13 he goes to the pool, he gets his healing, he comes back. Now, in closing, this closing might take a minute. They basically spend the rest of the chapter condemning, convicting, chasing him down. Who sinned? Who sinned? The answer to who sinned, you or your folks, everybody says, well, it's sin that causes sickness. I just laid that out for you as clearly as it can be laid out for you, that your sin will produce destruction. 1 John 3, 8. He that committed sin is of the devil, for the devil sins from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he destroy the works of the devil. Hallelujah. If you sin, you're of the devil. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. I don't want to be aligned up with someone Jesus came to destroy. I, I just don't. I, I believe Jesus Christ is the most powerful most powerful, all powerful. And I don't want to be an enemy. And you're an enemy of God when you're friends with the world. And I just don't want to be friends with the world anymore. I don't want to be an enemy of God. I don't want to be friends with the world. I don't want to be associates with the world. I live in this world. I know people say, I live in this world. I love this world. Look, I'm in this world. I'm going to love the world because Jesus Christ loved the world. And he put the love of the world in me. And every day, these last few days, it seems like that's what he keeps birthing in me a little more is loving my fellow man, but not loving him with some pandering. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's not going to be okay. It's not, if you, I, I hear men say this all the time, God's got you. It's going to be okay. It's not going to be okay if God does not have you. 
if you are not born again and you are not following. If he has told you to go to the pool of Salaam and you are not going, you are not going to get what you're supposed to get. Amen. This man blind has told to do something. Had he not done it, I do not believe he'd have been healed. I don't know why. Jesus spit on the other guy and said, you healed? And the guy said, yeah, I can see men as trees. And then he prays for him again. The guy didn't have to do anything other than answer a question. Many other people, Peter's mother-in-law, the, the, the man with the withered hand, had to answer questions, had to go to Jesus. That Basic. This guy, though, gets told, go to the pool. I don't know why. I don't know why he had to go to the pool, but he did. I got theories, but I like the way Fennis Stake put it in his notes. If you read them, he basically says, don't let no man's theories become doctrine in Scripture because they're just my theories. I love the tie-in between men, clay, anointing, and scent. I love that. I love that. Because what happens to him right afterwards? He goes out and preaches the gospel. He goes out, and this takes a minute to read. It was the Sabbath day when Jesus, verse 14, actually, go back up to 12. Then said they unto him, where is he? He said, I don't know. Oh, actually, verse 11. I know, I'm jumping around. He answered and said, A man that called, was called Jesus made clay, anointed me, and I was I can see. Told me to go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went, and I washed, and I received sight. Then said they unto him, Where is he? He said, I know not. They brought to the, to, they brought to the Pharisees him that was blind. And it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay. Your Savior loves to rock the boat. Now, mind you, people use these verses to justify rebellious behavior. Anybody out there right now trying to declare rebellion and rebellious behavior and not abiding by the simple requests of men that are not impeding on what God said for you to do in that moment. Mind you, we're not under the law, so be led by the Spirit. What do I mean? You walk into a store that has signs up and you don't want to wear a mask or whatever have you, and the Holy Spirit, I get convicted by the Holy Spirit when I walked in. I'm not wearing a mask today. I read it on Facebook. That's how I make a stand for righteousness. You want to stand for righteousness, stand outside this door without a mask, a bottle of oil, and, 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 a, and a gospel script and get everybody saved. That's standing for righteousness. Not wearing a mask or wearing a mask to me is like, really, that's the hill you want to die on and call yourself like, oh, I'm going to go for Jesus and I'm going to fight the mask war. Man, I'm glad you are. God bless your heart. Send the anointing with them. You want to fight the mask war? Get as many people as possible saved. Because if you think this is the last garment they're going to ask you to put on that you don't want to wear in this world, well, no matter what country you're in, heading towards the day of him, his coming back, well, you're hit for a rude awakening. Because once they start the wars and rumors of wars, which I don't think are fully manifest, once the plagues come, and, and we better you better pray that the people that believe in, in the rapture are right. Because we don't want to be anywhere near all that. I digress. And it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay. Because he already proved to him that he was Lord of the Sabbath. And what did they do when he was Lord? They went away and wanted to kill him. But they sure didn't stop him. Because they can't. They're, that's why I love this minister I'm listening to now. A couple of them. It's not just about you going out in rebellion. Understand. To go out. If you're going to rebel. Technically you're not in rebellion. If you're being led by the Spirit of God. The people I see commenting and posting on social media, their rebellion, are bullcrap sissies who are doing nothing but posting it and condemning their neighbor while they sit on the couch and get fat during a pandemic. Not interested in that. Why are they getting fat? Because nobody's getting saved. Nobody's getting set free. Nobody's getting born again. They're not even going to their church. If their church is open and it's taking 50 registrants instead of being one of those 50 and walking in and kneeling down and begging God to blow the place open and change the pastor's heart and let this thing come wide open and they're fasting and praying and seeking it, they're home posting. Because that's what we've turned into. Church condemning church. Men condemning men. Yes, I am judging them right now. I am casting out. Why? Because they're not following the Spirit. The Spirit of God is not home posting on Facebook when the world is out there dying. You look out the world and say everybody needs to take their mask off. I say let them all keep mask on, put put all their tutu crap on, but get them saved. Get them born again. Get them filled with the Holy Ghost. And I've already told you in many videos, I've repented for not having this passion, this burning sensation. Always a weird way to word it. Burning desire to see these people changed. I've had it to teach them. But now I got it. I just want to see them get saved. Get them, get them started in that. And I, I, I know for a fact that some will hear this one day and go, I told that guy he'd be like that one day. Well, you're right. I'm wrong. I'm good with that. Who cares? Let's move on. 
Because that's exactly Jesus' answer when they say to him, who sinned? Who cares? Who sinned? Who cares? Jesus doesn't say, well, it's his mother, it's his father's brother. He says, it doesn't matter. Who cares? He actually tells them neither. But in reality, by answering the question in two simple verses, he says, who cares? I'm here. I'm the light of the world. Let's go. Hey, man, who really caused this thing with the masks and all this pandemic? And is it the Wuhan? Is it China? Who's the root cause of why America's in the state it's in? Who cares? Go set fire to your neighborhood with the gospel, the full gospel, not the Mamby Pamby. Just say this prayer one time. Go get the place set ablaze. I've put my feet down in a section of D.C. And I've said, God, my from the job site, to every gym I go to, to the campground I'm in, they're going to be ablaze with the gospel. I'm going to preach the gospel. I'm not just going to post it on YouTube and tell people to do it. I'm going to preach the gospel. Get me tents, get me chairs, get me money. Let's get this thing moving forward. And I'm going through a season right now of what direction is first and letting him align that direction. Because this year we're going to see thousands get saved, born again, filled with the Holy Ghost, baptized baptized in fire, and set free through real repentance. Not this, I'm a sinner, but biblical confession of sin, repentance, and set free to go walk and follow the Holy Ghost unhindered every day of their life in this blessing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Then again, the Pharisees, verse 15, then again, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. And he said unto them, he put a clay upon my eyes and I washed and I see. Therefore said some of the Pharisees, this man's not of God. Yeah, because everybody heals blind guys isn't of God. Now, mind you, Pharisees, I don't know if they knew this, but we do today, that there will come a time when there will be someone that will be doing miracles. They will be doing miracles. And those miracles will not be, um, how do I say it? They will not be from God. It says it. I believe it's after the rapture, but they're coming. So they might have thought, well, this guy's not got anybody can do miracles. There are, in the, in the, over, over in the, mostly in the Eastern Hemisphere, there are people that perform miracles from other religions. And someone say, well, how is that? It's a longer story. But Young E. Cho actually taught me that in his book, Fourth Dimension. They said to the blind man, again, what sayest thou of him that he opened thine eyes? He said, he's a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind. They didn't believe he's blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him that received his sight. They called his mommy and daddy to say, is this guy really blind? And they asked them, saying, is your son? Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he see? His parents answered and said, I don't know. That's pretty much what they said. We know that it's our son and that he was born blind, but by what means he now sees, we do not know. Or who has opened his eyes, we do not know. He's of age. Ask him, and he'll speak for himself. These words the parents spoke because they feared the Jews, because the Jews had already, already agreed. The Jews had already agreed at this point, like a year into Jesus' ministry, maybe two, that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. They don't want to get put out of the synagogue. Therefore said his parents, he is of age, ask him. Then again called they the man that was blind and said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. Now, that's important to stop and note. Give God the praise. They were okay with God getting the praise. We know this man's a sinner. He answered and said, Whether he be a sinner, I don't know. One thing I know, I was blind and now I see. Hallelujah. We could stop there, but we're not going to. Then said they to him again, What did he do to you? He opened my eyes. How did he open your eyes? He answered and said, I've told you this already. Did you not hear me? Now will you hear it again? Are you also going to be his disciples? Then they reviled him and said, you're you're his disciple, but we're Moses' disciple. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for this guy, we don't know where he is from. That's the key. They didn't know where he's from. Where's this guy from? We know Moses. The man answered and said unto them, Why herein is a marvelous thing that you know not from where he is, and yet he has opened my eyes? 
You don't know. I'm going to read this in the NLT because, well, I would if I had the NLT. Oh, yeah, I do. I got to read this in the NLT. I feel like there's a, an understanding there that we need to grab a hold of. Verse 39, verse 30, I'm going to the NLT. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed Jesus. Why, that's very strange, the man replied. He healed my eyes, and yet you don't know where he comes from? Verse 31, we know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but he's ready to hear those who worship him and do his will. Ever since the world began, no one has been able to open the eyes of someone born blind. If this man were not from God, he couldn't have done it. You were born a total sinner, they answered. Are you trying to teach us? And they threw him out of the synagogue. Oh, I like the way they, I like the way they word that. I'm going to go back to the King James. I like to jump back and forth. I do believe the King James. I do believe the NLT. I believe a few versions, actually. The man answered and said to them, Why do you marvel at such a thing? You don't, and you don't know where he's from, yet he opened my eyes. Now we know that God hears not sinners. But if any man be a worshiper of God and does his will, him he hears. Watch that. If any man be a worshiper of God and does his will, that's who God hears. They answered and said unto him, If this man, actually they said, Since the world began, it was not heard. Since the world began, it has not been heard that any man's opened the eyes of a blind man. If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. They answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and now you teach us. And they cast him out. That is what a friend of the world. These people are of the world. They're of their father, the devil. We've already talked about this. We've established it. That's what people who are friends with the world are going to do to you. They're going to cast you out. For, and that's one of the reasons why I think it's one of the hindrances to people getting healed. They know fundamentally in their heart of hearts, if I get this healing, if I get this fullness of the gospel, if I get this Holy Spirit, if I get that fire, I'm going to start looking like one of them kooky guys like Griff and his family and his church people. I'm going to start speaking in unknown tongues. I'm going to start seeing these manifestations of miracles. And then I'm going to get tossed out of everywhere in my life. Yes, absolutely. 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 As God gives me peaks at the road ahead of me in these last in these last couple months that he's taken me and, and we've just pressed in and he as he's taken me into this road of showing me peaks of what's ahead, I think to myself, I just giggle. Like half of me wants so everybody says if one guy gets in office, the church is gonna get persecuted. But I've seen the church get persecuted the last year with the guy I voted for in office that wasn't supposed to let the church get persecuted. So I just looked at God and said, I don't, I, honestly, I only care for the abortion. I only care because I thought we had a shot at righteousness in America still. That's the only reason I voted the way I voted and the way I cared. I saw no righteousness in the other side. You, can, you, you, you see the fake love. You see the, the pandering to the sexual sin. You see the fake, and I say fake love because you see them. It's fake. When it, it, every movement for civil rights since that's been going on out there, that I just I see it. I see it being led by sexual sinners, and I said that'll never produce um, real, real equality. Only the Holy Spirit and the Church of Jesus Christ will produce real equality. Nobody else, no other religion has real equality. None of the fake Christian religions have real equality. Only in the Holy Ghost is there equality for man. It because I read it to you earlier. The blessing of Christ Jesus maketh you rich. You say, well, finances, here you go again. No, it's maketh you rich. You become, you have the access to all things in him, in Christ Jesus. Only Jesus Christ as your Lord, as your leader, and the Holy Spirit is the one you follow because of Jesus. Only in Jesus are, are, do you have any chance of equality. Well, does that mean we don't march, pray, and seek for our brothers? and say, No, it doesn't mean any of that. It just means that if you're not in Christ doing it, I've said this at my church when preaching, I say it on the videos many times, only in Christ and following him will you have any mark. Otherwise, you're going to wind up looking up and you're going to realize you're following two lesbians who are going to hell and you're, it's the best you got. Now, the sad part for the church is that's, the, that's why they were able to get the leadership and the role they got is because we've sat dormant. And I haven't sat dormant. I've been teaching men for 23 years how to believe, how to follow God. But some people, and I think the church as a whole, 
we could speak and say, we've not done our due diligence. We've not done our this or that. We certainly didn't press in. But that's why, because they're not Jesus Christ. We pandered to this mess of fake love instead of looking out and preaching the gospel, the full gospel. And the people that have, which are many in the church that have, have sounded this alarm for a long time. This man is in the church and he's in the synagogue and he's getting cast out because that's what's going to happen. Everybody following one of these sinful leaders that thinks they're in Christ are going to get cast out of there and they're going to get tossed once they get the Holy Ghost. Once you get the Holy Ghost, you're going to be hanging out in a synagogue, church somewhere, and they don't have the Holy Ghost. You're going to get the Holy Ghost. You're gone. You're gone. And, that, and, and, and you need to have great joy at that day because God saved you. Because those people will spend the next weeks and months ahead convincing you that your healing came from some. They'll even, like these guys did, oh no, give God the glory. But do not say, Jesus is the Christ. <laughs> Catch that. Give God the glory, but do not say, Jesus is the Christ. Praise Allah. Talk about some Hare Krishna. Get down with some, some Siddhartha, some Buddha guy. But do not say that Jesus is the Christ. Do not. Say anyone is the Christ or you're out of here. They had already agreed on that. If anyone claims the Christ, they're out of here. They, they, didn't, they never wanted the Christ to come. They, they, he, they knew when Jesus Christ shows up, when the Christ comes, the Messiah comes, it's his show and it's over for us. That's the same way in your life. That's why a lot of us can't ever receive him until we get totally blasted. We can't receive him until we get totally blasted the bottom and we look up and realize, okay, we're ready for a Lord now. That's why you look in the church and a lot of these manby pamby types that are pandering to all these people trying to love them around, they're actually maintaining them at bottom and helping them drag along bottom because that's where they're at because they don't want to take one more step and let it go and have a Lord. They read the Bible and then mix the scriptures up to try to convince that what their beliefs are are accurate instead of reading the Bible and letting the Word of God dwell in them richly and transform them completely. And you're around them. You see them. They're the ones that posted the pictures of them this year at Christmas and on New Year's, slugging back the bourbon, slugging back the wine, slugging back the beers, slugging back their... And you say, well, they only had one or two drinks. I don't care how many they had. I have yet to meet a born-again Christian that's out pounding some beers out, that's out enjoying that, that I think in one shape or form, and I used to think it's because I came from that background. No, I look and I think, I don't see it. Well, they drank wine in the Bible. They drank crushed grapes in the Bible. I've known that for 23 years because when I got in, the first thing I said is, God, you called me to follow you. You have Jesus. He drinks wine. I am, I am a junkie. What's up with this? And I needed peace, and I knew from then. While well, they fermented it for 100 days. Man, you think these... I don't even go down this road. You just, you're just a fool if you think they're all sitting around getting drunk. If they drank wine, sunrise, the sun. Well, the water, the this. I don't care. They weren't doing it. You say, well, the Bible's... I know what the Bible says. And he made the wine and he served good wine to them. Good tasting wine. He made it. You think God who told you don't drink and get drunk also tells you now, here, here's a bunch of wine to get drunk off of. It's really high. For, no, and I'm not telling you that are Christian, you can't have a beer, you can't have a wine or any of that. But I said slugging back. So don't mix my words, and I won't mix them. But the point is, is these folks, they, they are casting out a man who was healed of blindness, tearing him up. We've seen all five things. We've seen this man healed. Now we've seen this man cast out. Now watch what happens. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, because that's what he does. He listens. And when he had found him, he said unto him, Do you believe that I am the Son of God? Or do you believe on the Son of God? And he answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? See, now he calls him Lord, because why? He's already shown he's got power. Same reason why Paul, when he got knocked off his high horse, said, Lord, why? Because he recognized that this guy was more powerful than him. Now, I can't use the term, he was a power greater than him, because people will say, oh, you're talking about higher powers, and the church gets all crankly about it. But he had the Lord, and he calls him Lord, because he goes, okay, I just got not. And then that day and era, that's what you said. When someone showed they had power greater than you, you said, Lord. I mean, that's what we say today. We might not use the word Lord, but we, we have our words we use. And he said, Lord, and, and Jesus said unto him, thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with you. 
And he said, Lord, the blind man, the, the man that was blind, said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. And Jesus said, for judgment I come unto this world, that they which see not will see, and that they which see might be blind. Woo. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? And Jesus said unto them, If you were blind, you should have no sin. Now, that's an interesting phrase. But now you say, we see, therefore your sin remains. They did not believe. Don't read into that about sin and blindness. I already taught you about that. They did not believe. And if you do not believe, you are blind already. A lot of Bibles headline, if you look at it, they'll headline that section of scripture and call it spiritual blindness. I'm pretty sure I just saw it in one of mine, but. Old, they'll, they'll headline that section of scripture and call it spiritual blindness. They will say that that's the point where God's showing you you're blind. You do not see the Christ standing right in front of you. Here's the thing I'll challenge you with today. that number we, We've went through the five, but I want, to, I want to sidebar with this challenge and say, do we, all of us, need to look at this today? Do we see Jesus today? And do we see Jesus as this friendly guy that called some fishermen and grabbed a tax collector and saved some souls and healed some people? Or do we see Jesus the Christ? And, and I don't need to tell you Christ isn't his last name. It's a declaration and a title. It's, who, it's, it's his who he is through and through. If a man ever wore a title that was to him through and through, Jesus Christ does. Jesus is his name. Christ is his calling, anointing title. And Jesus Christ is the Lord Jesus Christ. Curious, Jesus Christos. The Lord, only Greek I actually know and can remember. I just love the way it sounds. Curious, Jesus Christos. The Lord Jesus Christ. Not saying that to brag. I just love the way it rolls off my tongue. And it does sound cool when I say it. And it closes up this video beautifully by saying to you, He is the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you, in all that you do, made him Lord. Now, mind you, roll with me to Romans. And I'm, I'm honestly going to close with this. Actually, I'm not in any hurry to close. My alarm did go off saying it's time to go to work. Good news is, they don't mind what schedule I keep. And I've got a busy day today. It's going to be a great one. Romans 10 The word is near thee, actually Romans 10 verse 8, the word is near thee, the word is near thee, the word is near thee, in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach, hallelujah, that if you confess with the mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him, the Lord Jesus, from the dead, you shall be saved. So have you done that today? Confess the Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, I believe in my heart that you were raised from the dead. Thank you. God, show me. Search my heart. Even though I've been saved 25 years and born of your spirit for 23, I thank you that you, sir, that you, sir, are Lord. And that I know that I've not walked perfectly in the flesh as you being Lord. There's always an area you can search my heart and help me move a little bit more, press in a little bit deeper, go towards the high call. It's not about necessarily having sin. I need to repent, but search my heart and show me that if there are any. Search our heart this morning and show us, or whenever anybody listens to this, and show us, God, if there's anything we have that's blocking us from you and you from us, anything holding you back from fully manifesting in our lives, to hear your voice, to talk and preach and profit with all, operating in the gifts of the Spirit to our neighbor, because you gave the gifts of the Spirit for us and for our neighbor to profit all. And God, I feel like today's the day. Break forth. You said in Isaiah 58, I think verse 8 or 9, you said you'll break forth. Your light will break forth. Your healing will come speedily. That this, this is what you've called us in this season to do and to see manifest. So let them go and let them bring the light. That's you, Jesus, because Jesus is the light to a lost and dying world, to a dark world, 
to a wicked and iniquitous generation and people. Let them bring the light. Let's all go out and bring the light and spread it. A lot of times all you got to do is have joy and have joy and have joy and pray in that atmosphere once you get in it. Devils be rebuked. Hearts are going to be open. Someone in this work atmosphere wants to receive Jesus as Lord. Someone in this world I'm walking in is going to be saved today in Jesus' name. I'm drawing, I'm lifting up Jesus. God's drawing men to Jesus. Jesus is Lord. I love you. He is the Christ. Have a great day. God bless you.